welcome. I'm Brent Blass, Interim Executive Director of the National Building Museum. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the museum's 40th anniversary this week. On December 12th, 1980, President Jimmy Carter signed Public Law 96-515, which established a National Museum of the Building Arts, whose home would be the historic Pension Building. Since that time, the museum's mission evolved and expanded in scope and scale, but it has always been unique to serve as the country's only cultural institution dedicated to inspiring curiosity and knowledge, and knowledge about the built environment. For four decades, we have presented critically acclaimed exhibitions that have addressed a wide range of topics, from design and construction to advances in sustainability and resilience to social justice issues. Our award-winning teen programs have engaged and empowered younger generations with the knowledge and tools to advocate for a better built world. And our prestigious public programs, such as Spotlights on Design, have allowed people to engage with world famous designers, industry leaders, and other notables through a variety of formats. We start this week's celebration with tonight's program documenting crossroads. Unfortunately, with the pandemic surgery, surging around our country, this is a very timely subject. And I look forward to the conversation between Camilo Jose Vergara and Elihu Rubin. I want to give a special thank you to the CoStar Group and all of our 40th anniversary donors for making this birthday week of free programming possible. I also want to recognize the great team at the National Building Museum who produced this program and all the events in our 40th birthday celebration. We need your help as well. Please consider supporting the museum with a year-end gift. If you're not a member already, consider joining our membership program. You will get an early access and discounts to other museum programs and events. And if you're already a member, thank you for your support. It directly uh, influences our ability to create world-class programs and exhibitions. This holiday season, you can also gift a membership to family and friends. And please visit our website, nbm.org, nbm.org for more details. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Kathy Frankel, who is Vice President for Exhibitions and Collections at the National Building Museum. Thank you so much, Brent. And thank you all for joining us tonight for this first program of our birthday week celebration. This feels like the perfect pro program with which to begin as our longest standing relationship with an exhibition collaborator is with Camilo Jose, Jose Vergara. Camilo's work defies definition. He is part photographic documentarian, part socio sociologist and social observer and part man on the street. But for us, he is someone who like us looks at our built world to understand how people are affected by and how they affect their surroundings. Our first exhibition with Camillo was the New American Ghetto in 1996. Since then, we've presented exhibitions um, of his work on the Latino neighborhoods of Los Angeles, Remembering the Twin Towers, an exhibition that went on view less than two months after 9-11, Storefront Churches and the Changing Landscape of Detroit. So when Camilla called us shortly after the pandemic struck, telling us he had been out and about in the streets of New York documenting what was going on, we jumped on the chance to work with him on a dig digital presentation of his work. Who would have thought this spring that he'd still be out there photographing in December? He said he was still out there today, but this is where we find ourselves. I hope that everyone has had a chance to look at his now three photo essays, including the most recent that just went online last week. While this fascinating documentation of how our world is changing every day with this pandemic, I am thrilled to be part of a project that will undoubtedly be looked at in the future as a window into the uncertainty of the times that we are living in right now. For the second two essays that we presented, we were lucky enough to have Camillo enlist the talents of Elihu Rubin. Elihu is a, an associate professor of urbanism at the Yale School of Architecture with a secondary appointment in American studies. His work perfectly syncs with Camillo's work as it bridges urban disciplines focusing on history and the theory of city planning, urban geography and the cultural landscape, transportation and mobility, and the social life of urban space. 
Elihu became an integral part of the process of creating these essays, working with Camillo to com craft a visual narrative and writing some of the associated words that went along with it. I feel privileged to have been part of some of the conversations as this work came together and I'm thrilled to be able to turn the program over to Camillo and Elihu so that you too can get a feel for how these wonderful collaborators work together to bring this project to life. So have at it. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Brent. And thanks to all of you uh, out there for spending uh, a little bit uh, of your evening with us here on Zoom. Um, you know, we really do want to keep this a, uh, uh, a conversational event. Uh, even though it's a webinar format, uh, Camilo and I will be uh, speaking back and forth over a series of images that that I've put together, every single image, of course, one of Camillo's from his documentation of, of the crossroads, as we'll be speaking about today. But we do have a Q&A um, function here on Zoom. We want to encourage you to go ahead and ask questions through the Q&A, and um, I will do my best to monitor that and to jump to the Q&A when, when relevant, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my uh, screen now. Um, and jump into this presentation. <laughs> now, why, why are you laughing? I was going to say, you know, when you're friends with Camilla, you sometimes open up your, uh, your inbox and you get uh, images like these, and you, you don't always know exactly what they mean. Camilla, is this your way of sending me a season's greeting of, of some kind? This, this is something I saw yesterday or the day before in Brooklyn. And I was startled because, 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 I mean, this is Santa Claus. This is what little kids are taking to see them. I mean, this is what's going to bring them presents. Right. But the pandemic has changed and has changed almost everything. It, it, the pandemic has placed itself in it, it, Easter, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Labor Day, and, uh, and now Christmas. So here you have a degenerate Santa Claus. Yeah, and that seems to be one of the themes that, that comes through or one of the arguments of, of your photography that the pandemic has suffused everything and it can be perceived in the visual life, the visual culture um, of the city, even in this, uh, even in this deranged uh, Santa Claus. Uh, you know, it, it is re really incredible and, and saddening that, that we are still in the midst of this pandemic, uh, as bad now as it ever was. Um, this beginning in, in March, uh, you know, we, we went through, oh, let me see. We went through um, a graduation cycle where uh, we, we had to sort of celebrate uh, the, the graduates in, in new ways, like these photographs on the street. You know, we uh, we adjusted to uh, to a new normal of having our temperatures checked as we uh, walked into um, places when they finally did uh, open up again. And then, of course, over the summer and continuing today, there was a, a, a crescendo of, of social justice activism um, where it had to be said that Black Lives Matter um, uh, in, in, in the wake of the, the terrible uh, uh, killings of, of George Floyd and, and others. Um, and of course, in, in many ways, we, we were coming together. I mean, there was a ritual in New York at 7 p.m. Um, of clapping for all of the essential workers. And then, of course, there were those, um, those small rebuttals, perhaps, like, like this image, Camilo, that you captured at the at the Myrtle Avenue uh, subway. What, what, what did you make of, of this picture? Uh, don't clap, uh, pay more. And, and it didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. last, I, 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 I am in that train station about once a week. And uh, I'm sort of looking for this. And, yeah. and it's not there. Uh, I mean, of course, the, the, the meaning of this, and I think, I think it applies more to the non-unionized people than to the unionized people mm -hmm. because the, the non-union people are being paid minimum wage to clean up the subways and to be in the stations and to be breathing the foul air 
the union people have many more protections and uh, and in some ways the their space the space where they work uh, has been a wrench in some way that uh, you know they even though it's still dangerous and something like 130 employees of the MTA have actually gotten have died of covid yeah uh so so uh so yes, yes. I yeah, mean, it's uh, it's a biting critique, uh, you know that uh, that these these forms of appreciation are are certainly nice, but uh, they may not fix the the deep uh, inequalities that um, already existed and have been exposed uh, even more forcefully through the pandemic. You know, of course, all of the images I've just shown are are part of this this broader project of yours of documenting crossroads, and we've just launched. Uh, um, working with the Building Museum, working with uh, Chrysanth uh, uh, Broikos as, as well, who's absolutely central, and, and working with um, Braulio and, and others at the, the Building Museum. And I encourage everyone out there to go to the website and to check out the many, many photographs from, from this third installment of Documenting Crossroads and going back and watching them change. Because just as you say, you're revisiting these places um, over and over and over again, and and seeing the ephemeral um, uh, interventions in the built environment. But I think it's important for the audience. To, yeah, no, please go ahead, Camila. Yeah, you want the places to tell you the story as it happens. Yeah. And you stand in front of something, and you don't know what that something is going to be tomorrow, or the next week, or the next month particularly when the situation is very stressful as it is right now. Well, this is exactly exactly what I want to get into right now, the way in which you have been tracking time in a very foreshortened period, because I think it's important for the audience to know out there um, just a little bit about your work over the past 45 years of tracking time um, in America's um, often disinvested, deindustrializing cities. Uh, I mean, for example, a, a lot of your work has documented over time kind of urbanism in subtraction, right? In places like Chicago, returning to the same streetscape, not necessarily in a period of months, but a period of years to see it change. Um, or a place, of course, like Detroit, which has seen quite a lot of subtraction um, over the years. Um, so your tracking time uh, comes from you returning to the same places, again, 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 uh, years um, coming back year after year, um, five years at a time to all of these sites, tracking time now over decades. And you come up with these incredible uh, observations. I mean, take a place like, like Harlem that you wrote about recently in your book, um, called Harlem, the, the unmaking of the ghetto. I'm just going to flip through these quickly, and they can all be seen on your website. I love it when you do twins. What, what is it about these twins? Maybe you can say, Camilo, as I flip through these, these images, you know, the, the sort of twin storefronts here. What is it about the twins that sort of fascinates you so much as we kind of watch them change over time, over the many years you observe them? It's that they are such an example of American individualism. Yeah. It's like, I go my way. Right. <laughs> you do your thing, I do my thing, which is, right. of course, now with, with the pandemic, you know, that has a disastrous consequences. But, uh, but here, it's, it's somehow, I mean, it may not seem to be the, you know, the most aesthetically pleasing forms, but on the other hand, they are lively. Yeah. And and, and you know, and they sort of keep you sort of plugged in, you know, you want to know what's coming next. I mean, here, the last picture, there are all those folks dressed in green mm -hmm. and, and they work, they are part of the church and they are out in the street recruiting people and what they are, what they are offering, it's some kind of a cure for despair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's basically what they are standing doing. I mean, from the perspective of an urban historian, it's just incredibly valuable this archive you've created, and of course, it's 
It's one reason why the National Building Museum has uh, featured your work so much over the years and, and why the work is now being collected by the Library of Congress, because this really is a, a document of our cities. C can I indulge in one more sequence of a, of a, of a building uh, tracking time over decades that I just find fascinating, the, the Metropolitan Building in, in Detroit? Um, and you can see, I don't, I think I might've taken the dates off, but this begins somewhere in the 1990s, I, I believe. S say again? 93 is the first picture. Begins in 93, as you begin to see changes at the street level of the Metropolitan Building. Now you can see the, um, what, what year was the Super Bowl in Detroit? Oh, you got me there. Well, I can't remember, but that's when this mural, mural was put up during the Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, now you see this, um, the, the boards of authenticity when the ruins of Detroit were kind of uh, associated in some sense with, with authenticity and the city's efforts to rebrand and, and redevelop itself. And yet that, that didn't last very long. Um, but, but more recently we see investment coming forward, um, fixing it up. And then the last image is this new hotel. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible to see uh, this building evolve over, over the decades in, in Detroit. We evolve, be reborn. To be reborn, yes, yes. And, and this is, and we learn a lot about places like uh, Harlem or Detroit, uh, even through these singular examples. But, but this work has been all about places you call the crossroads, Camillo. And they're all in the greater New York area. Of course, everyone's um, travel has, has, been, um, has, has been eliminated because of the pandemic. But, but how would you describe these crossroads to, to our audience? Why, why choose these, uh, these particular places? And I think on the left, I have um, Roosevelt Avenue. M maybe these are both from that area. On the right is the, the, uh, the seven train at Broadway and Elmhurst. Um, what, yeah. what are the crossroads? Well, you see, what I was looking for were places that sort of intensify the urban experience. Yeah. We had two choices with the pandemic. One of them was to go all over the place, you know, walk every street, see everything. Yeah. Which, which it was not possible for me. So it's, it's well, my need from the crossroads first had to do with looking for places where the urban experience would be intensified. The urban experience is intensified, yeah. Where, where things would happen quicker, where you would see the new trends, where you would see changes in a, in a, in a it, it, it would take a lot in a shorter time. Yeah. So where, what were those places? So mm. those places were places where either several subway lines would come together and bus lines. So there were busy nodes. Yeah and transportation nodes. And what I found out is that, of course, the ones that interested me, me were mostly segregated. So that the population that I encountered were, was mostly Black and Latino. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, uh, I found out that most of these crossroads were located in New York City because once other cities do have crossroads, mm -hmm. but they are they are not in segregated areas. For instance, in Chicago, you find a lot of them around the loop. Mm -hmm. so, but the moment you go to the south side or you go to the west side, you begin to you you sort of lose that density, and uh, and with it you lose this all of the things that are with it. Like here, you can see the street vendors. Yeah. You can see the, I mean, of course, the transportation system and so on. Yeah. I mean, these were always places, uh, uh, aren't they, Camilla, where um, physical distancing w was always going to be difficult. They, as you say, they really are uh, intense nodes of, of urban life. And of course, one of the elements they have in common is a lot of street vending, a lot of commerce, they're commercial centers. And I think that there are some good examples in, in your work about the kind of compressed patterns. I mean, we know, for example, that um, retail has been hit incredibly hard 
by the pandemic. I mean, this is a, a bigger story because we know retail has um, retail is constantly obsolescing itself. Retail is is having to street level retail is now having to compete with with Amazon, of course, and the rest. Um, but we see a lot happening within the time period of the pandemic where legendary retailers like like Dr. J's, which began in the Bronx and was associated with hip hop culture going back to the 1970s, um, ended up closing. And we see the juxtaposition in this series um, of what's happening with Dr. J's and what's happening with the area around it. Of course, we can't uh, ignore in, in this image how um, some of the, the current events, the, the murder of George Floyd, for example, is, uh, is noted now in the metal grates of Dr. J's. But the store closes or begins to close and yet around it, there's this vital commercial life that seems to swirl all around it. How do you, how do you reconcile this? How, how do you begin to think about um, these kinds of differences? Um, what's going on on the outside and the fact that the brick and mortar store is, is having to close? Well, it's having to close, but it's also changing. You can see that big tube coming out of the store yeah. It's, it's bringing more ventilation. I was today in front of that store and the sign there, there was this, the middle signs were changed and also it said that there was a 20% discount over all the discounts that were already given to the people there. Yeah. Uh, but you also, you know, with the, with the unemployment that is created by the pandemic, the closing of the hotels, the closing of the restaurants. Yeah. You know, you have a lot of unemployed people that have to make a living, particularly those who don't have papers. And, the, and, and for those people, being able to make a few dollars means that they'll pay the rent or that they'll be able to eat unless mm -hmm. they can get free food. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <clears throat> so you have you have uh, more and more people are forced to go into the streets to sell you know a, a, a variety of things that you know even though street vendors were out there before there was never this number yeah. and, they, and they never sold this tremendous variety of uh, items. Now let, let me let me help get to that in some of these next pictures. Uh, I just wanted to show Adams quickly because it showed how compressed the, these changes are. Here's Adams Furniture and Electronic going out of business, and then really a couple months later, it looks like it's been out of business for decades. I mean, it's 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 incredible the kinds of Twenty um, Fifth Street, you know, a really busy and vibrant street, and it's a street that had a lot of businesses, new businesses opening. I mean, you know, we just had a Whole Foods opening there, big one. I mean, one of the things we observe in your photos is how even, um, is how, you know, architectural infrastructure gets incorporated into the selling environment. Um, but you're right, we see an incredible diversity of things for sale. Uh, and, and of course, some of the pictures of the vending um, you know, they, they can be studied in and of themselves. I mean, there's a whole kind of narrative or social world here. Um, you know, you think about on the one hand, uh, the, the, the man who's gesturing to you, the kind of encounter with people on the street. There's the different ways in which people are or are not wearing masks. There's this craving for normalcy, right? Just having a toy, for example, or celebrating a birthday that's, that's in this image, which I think is so kind of touching. Um, and then, as you say, you, you have you have pictures like these, these individual peddlers. Um, what what how do you, how do you help us understand these these kinds of images? I think this is what you were getting at when you say that, you know, the kind of peddling for survival that's going on now, um, is um, is is somehow I, I don't know what the, what the right word is exactly. It's more um, it, it's on a smaller scale and and sometimes more desperate than it's been in the past. Well, also they don't occupy space because here you carry your own merchandise. Right. 
And sometimes it just like in, in the case at the bottom, you know, it's just selling a bag of Thai. Yeah. I remember, you know, I'll never forget that that bag of Thai was yeah. being sold for $8, you know, and the two of them and the woman was begging and she was holding a cup, you know, to beg so that they wanted to make sure that they got some money, some money came their way. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's it's this tremendous variety. I mean, there are some uh, places that are selling food, you know, like food stands, taco stands, and then they have been able to form like a little restaurant around it, mm -hmm. or a barbecue place in in Bedford Stuyvesant, you know, mm -hmm. that it's, that has it's carried by by a pickup truck, put into place. And then all of this sort of heavy iron stuff gets set and the customers come around. So, so that, that, that it goes from one extreme to the other. You have the woman that it has two boxes of Advil mm -hmm. and she's selling them. And, 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 and then you have the other extreme, you know, the thing that is almost a restaurant. Well, of course, even in this small way, it's an indication of um, of the terrible uh, economic desperation that that the country is feeling right now. Twenty more than twenty million people lost lost their jobs, and uh, and we know that the distribution of those losses have been have been uneven. Uh, there's reporting in the New York Times even today or or recently about. You know the geography of job loss. The Upper East Side wasn't hit nearly as badly as the Bronx. I mean, none of this should be sur surprising, perhaps, but the pandemic has exacerbated these uh, these divisions. Um, and, and one of the things you draw out when looking at peddlers is how um, it, it becomes a family affair. I mean, we know that there's um, a, a concurrent crisis with with the schools, with childcare. Uh, I'm curious what draws you to these. Uh, images of, of the families who are selling? Well, it's, it's, it's the, the same thing with every other picture is that yeah. I want to know what else is in there. You know, you find a situation and then you go back and you find, you know, maybe the first time you didn't see the children there. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they were put in a box, you know, and the box was hidden. And then you see them. And you see them looking at the cell phone, you know, you know, doing some. At one point, there was one kid in one of the free food pictures that was inside a cart, and he was looking at the cell phone. Yeah. And I was able to look in a lot of detail to see whether that kid was being schooled. Mm -hmm. You know, whether he was zooming into, you know, some the school. Right. But then you know, I was able to see that it was YouTube, what he was watching, you know, so. Yeah, so, yeah. So. I, I think that's true of many of these photographs. And I say this for the benefit of the audience who will be going to the website and looking at them. There are times in which we can track change and marvel at the compression of urban changes, but then, you know, singular images uh, can be read and and reread uh, deeper and deeper. Each image, uh, their individual images that can be read as entire narratives. Um, of course, the whole um, explosion of of masks and masks becoming a a now ubiquitous source of uh, not not only in commerce but also of of fashion uh, is quite interesting. And I, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about about that. I mean, these were the two images I picked to. Kind of talk about it. I mean, on the one hand, the masks have now made their way to the mannequins, um, which which maybe was was predictable. Um, and there are many uh, you know public campaigns to encourage wearing masks. Not, some people are are doing it all the time. Some people some people aren't. Um, how how have you been perceiving this this element? I mean, it it's just exploded, hasn't it? Of course, that we started with the basic surgical mask and the I ninety fives. So it was like blue, blue, light blue and white, you know, and then all of a sudden they started to explode. And that's the picture that defines, I think, part two is just the lineup of masks. Yeah. So you, by that time, there was already, 
a tremendous variety of masks. And then with the George Floyd situation, there were people that would go around with a mask that said, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 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 so the two things became linked, you know, the pandemic and the, and the George Floyd situation. Yeah. And, uh, and here uh, you see another one of those linkages, which to me is really interesting. And it's the linkage between Christmas and the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm very much into documenting that uh, linkage. And what about these two images, Camilla? I mean, this to me is partly about, you know, grasping at, at normal life, the, the small pleasures in some sense, whether they're uh, flowers or, or birthday cake, or may, maybe another picture in this general category might be in Mothaven in, in, uh, in the Bronx of, of people gathering outside and, and having a meal. Um, yes, yes, and right under the freeway. Yeah. And it's some place that most people would have looked at uh, before th this happened, and they would have said, what a miserable place. Who would want to come in here? Right. And I remember just being there in the summer, and it looked like the friendliest and the most wonderful place to have a beer. Yeah. You know, they, they were feeling safe at that time, maybe falsely, and, you know, so that they felt they could come together. Yeah. But... Uh, <clears throat> You know, so that's what uh, you have here. What was the other part of your question? Well, I was just just reflecting on these kinds oh. of. Yes, yes. So first of all, I was surprised to see how much people care about flowers. Yeah. You know, I said, why now that everything is becoming difficult to get, now that there is no money, now there is no work, why do you want flowers? And uh, you know, I sort of love to play against myself, you know, rather than to say, I won't take pictures of the flowers, you know, it's just, it's just, you, you show them, they look beautiful, and they are the flowers, and they're wearing a mask behind. Yeah. And the other thing that I also realized that it was really powerful, is that how important things as birthdays became. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, these balloons that have written happy birthday. And, uh, <clears throat> and you would see them on the streets, you know. And I think this woman, <laughs> I heard her say something, but she was kind of happy that I took her picture, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, some, that's another theme I'm, I'm hoping we can draw out in some of these next photographs. Uh, are the kinds of encounters that you end up having with the people you take photographs of. Uh, I mean, we can't forget that, and maybe, maybe this is obvious, but every single photograph here is you. It implies your own presence in this place. And uh, when people read the, um, when people read the, uh, the overheard uh, comments that we have at the end of, of, uh, of part three, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll read about some of the kinds of encounters um, not, not always friendly with people that you meet meet on the street. Um. Well, that's for sure. That sometimes you feel like maybe you should get involved, uh -huh. and it's and it's and it's very difficult. It's it's just uh, in some situation because what you can do is very limited. When somebody needs to be taken to a hospital, needs to medical attention, uh, or uh, needs a place to stay or to leave, you know, I mean, I look out my window, you know, and there are people at one in the morning, you know, they're waiting for a bus there, a man and a child, you know, and they're talking and you feel, well, you know, this is terrible. Yeah, yeah. Let me, okay, I'm seeing, so, so uh, let me put it out there again to our, to our audience to please uh, jump into the Q, the Q&A. Um, um, and, and so please, please continue to do that. L let me let me work through a few more pictures here, Camillo. Uh, one of the themes in this uh, newest um, installation of, of your work here is about something to eat. And one of the trends, um, I don't mean to diminish it by calling it a trend, but one, one of the uh, one of the kind of um, 
uh, phenomena that cropped up, especially during the summer, were these um, community refrigerators or fridges, they were, they were sometimes called. Um, and you can see them, you know, come and go in the landscape in their own kind of ephemeral way. Um, like, like this one in, in Brooklyn that sort of had a, a life in, until it didn't anymore. Um, and, you know, these fridges, these community refrigerators, they, they often depended on, you know, the, the stewardship or the sponsorship of, um, of a local, um, of, of a local um, uh, a store or, uh, uh, or a cafe, for example, and also just the, the stewardship of the community all, all around them. Um, you know, it's a very, it's really kind of a, a small ephemeral architecture of good intentions. Uh, of course, meanwhile, you had the you had more serious social service organizations really, really kicking into gear as they began to provide food for people. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you look at these things and you felt uh, uh, very much with them. You, you look at these things, you mean, the, the, the fridges? The fridges, but also the people that are volunteering their time to bring food to someone that cannot actually get out of uh, of its apartment of the yeah. building and go and pick it up. Yeah, uh, you, you know, and uh, even in the fr the case of the fridges. Yeah, you know, it it to me it's it's. It, you hope, you want to see all that American idealism to sort of jump and all that energy, you, you know, and you know, there is so much of it. It's so boundless. And you say, well, you know, so you see it sometimes, like you see it in these two pictures. Yeah, you yeah. These kids, you know, they're going, God knows where they're going. And, and here is the church in Newark. You know, and I mean the first picture with the children. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of a, it's a sad picture. I was there, and I put my hand on my pockets to get my notebook out to write the kid's name. Yeah, and I take it out, and a bunch of dollars bills <laughs> flew on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. and a woman came and took them in no time. Says, "Can I have them?" <laughs> You know, of course, nine dollars. So, you know, I, it was it was just the, it, 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 the lack of money was just so it, it was felt. It was it was felt there. And well, th th this is um, th that that's right. I mean, it, and I think that the food insecurity has been one of the um, most sort of painful elements that's been brought to the surface here. I mean. This is the face of food insecurity, and and this is the face of of food insecurity. And there's a question here from from Michael Fagan, uh, Camillo. Did did anyone not want you to take their picture? I mean, the, these are sort of portraits um, on on the one hand, but uh, you know, if if not, what was their position? What was their reaction? Can you share something about that? The the people who well, don't want their pictures taken. Well, yes, of course, but yeah. you know, I mean, what what do happen is that I do, I take the photograph because first of all, you're seeing something which you find very touching, you know, yeah. a position, a way in which people align themselves like the men with the hand up and the way the two other faces in the back are, are lined up. If I stop and talk to him and ask him, can I take your picture? The whole composition would be destroyed. And as I was lucky that he was very happy and he gave me his name, his name is Paul. Mm -hmm. Now the next person I couldn't see, I said, look, you don't have to show me your face, you know, so sort of look down, mm -hmm. you can't see anything. So it's not, it's not violating a person's individuality and his, his, his rights. So, uh, you know, if somebody really, insist that they don't want their picture as it has happened to me a couple of times one times in a subway full of people yeah I mean, how could i go and ask an entire subway full of people uh can i take can i take your picture Each mm -hmm. one, by the time i'm done you know the subway has gotten to the end yeah so, 
so so what happens is that sure you erase the picture because people have asked you to do that because one person one person out of maybe 50 or 60 this is when the when the worst of the pandemic when the subways were crowded were very crowded yeah and people were there but there were tens yeah and, uh, you know i mean it 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 just it, the picture is like one more bother, but no, it's not a big bother. And yeah, I, no, no, sorry to, to interrupt. I mean, I, I just think our audience is very interested in that, um, in, uh, in the reactions of the people you take pictures of. Some people want to have their picture taken because they want to be seen, they want to be known, they want to be recognized. And other people don't want their picture taken because they find themselves in a compromising position or don't want to be seen asking for food. I mean, well, you at the beginning, of course, a lot of the people that were asking for food were yeah. asking for food, for free food for the first time in their lives. Yeah. And you could tell, I mean, you would look and, you know, most of their, their clothes were, they were sort of decent. They were, they were, they took good care of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know. Can I can I flip back? Um, I, I see the questions here, and I'm going to get to um, to all of them. I wanted to flip back to this picture in order to ask, uh, uh, if you don't mind, uh, this one of the of, of Mott Haven, right? Um, there's a question here from from Carol Rubin. She she asks, the pandemic asked us to stay inside, yet it was safest to be outside. So I'm wondering what aspects of outdoor space were rediscovered or reinvented during the pandemic. For instance, um, the picture of the cafe under the subway uh, was a great reuse of space that had been ignored until the pandemic. Uh, can you say something about that, about how spaces were rediscovered or reinvented um, during the pandemic? Well, you can also see all the vendors. Yeah. The vendors that get the, get the, all their gear, all this, you know, the tables, the chairs, you know, everything they need, and they tie it to those big pillars, yeah. you know, overnight, and then they come in the next day and they organize their business. It just, there is a little, there is a touch of Piranesi there that I saw in some of those really complicated subway structures that you see in the Bronx, for instance, Yeah, or in, in Queens. Well, so, does, no, no, I, no, I was going to say, I mean, whether or not these, I mean, is, is this something that, that interests you in particular, these kinds of architectural adaptations? Oh, yes, yes. It, yeah. You know, I mean, it, the, the other thing was the use of plastic, you know, to sort of separate people one from the other. Yeah. So, so you would, uh, you would put plastic in front of a place where you would, uh, get a drink or you would get coffee or you would get something mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you know well before you could go inside so so it it looked to me like uh, uh, many many places were being changed or transformed and it, it like in this case I mean I had seen a situation like this in Baltimore before you know this is a freeway up up on top is not uh, is not uh, it's going onto the Third Avenue Bridge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not the subway. But uh, uh, but I had seen one like this in Baltimore, and and you know you say well you know <laughs> you know this is not Versailles, but uh, but on the other hand, it's a happy place. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I. I find th th those observations in your photographs very interesting because, you know, there are many, um, there are architects and urban planners today that want to redesign the street or to design, um, you know, new, new ways of occupying it. And yet your, your images show that people are figuring it out on their own. You know, I mean, th there are adaptations that people are, are making uh, sort of independently. There's a kind of innate design instinct that's sort of out there. Um, but it's also it's also very transitory. If you remember, I tried to show you this place. Yeah. And the and the and the and there was no one there at that time. Was closed and right. there was nobody here. Yeah, yeah. Now let me let me get to another question, and I'll just catch up to where we were in our photographs. Um, 
because there's a question here, um, and, and here we are, you know, pretty close to the people that you're you're taking pictures of. And Ariel Siegel has a question. Um, how do you balance the importance of photographing in as much intimate detail as possible with the imperative of protecting your own health? Um, and thank, thank you for everything you do. That's from Ariel Siegel at the, at the Library of Congress. Well, well, well I, 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 I do, I mean, sometimes I pray. I mean, you know, I get caught in a situation where I know this is, if, if I stay here any longer, I'm toasted. And if that happens to be a subway where they, you know, where you can't open the door, <clears throat> it's just, you sort of look around and you find, you know, where the ventilation is, you know, if it's up yeah. on the roof, or you find what's the space where you can distance the best and where nobody, uh, where most people are wearing masks. So, so uh, you know, you sort of, you, 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 there are ways that you can minimize the risk, but the risk is there. And every time when I live this, uh, my <coughs> house, my apartment, every, you know, every day, I, I, I never know if I'm going to get the virus or not. Let's, let's look at the virus for a second. Um, on that on that note, and I haven't. I, I see these other questions. We're gonna we're gonna come to them, um, because you know the the virus um, has a phenotype. It has a physical shape, um, and as this as this uh, began to um, to spread, um, it, it became sort of abstracted. Right, there were ways in which we could we could we could draw a coronavirus monster. And you then have gone out there and taken pictures of sort of street scribblings that may be monsters in their own right. I mean, is it wrong for us to look at these images and see some kind of similarity? <laughs> well, I mean, there are, tell there, are, there are telling things. You know, one thing was the year. So if they have 20 there, yeah. you know, could be 2020. And for most most of the time when I had a chance to ask, most of the people didn't know who had done it and when it had done. Mm -hmm. when it, I, I mean, sometimes they, but they could tell me whether it was pre-pandemic or post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I know that most of these images, whatever I was able to ask or whatever I was able to go back through Street View and look at what they look like, like in November of 2019 or October of 2019, that that, uh, that, that image was not there, that that graffiti, that that tag was not there. So, so that was one way in which I got closer and closer to associate them with the pandemic. Then of course there was the crown Yes, the crown. The crown for Corona, the figure, the figure of death that you see there. And, and there was a sort of malevolent, there was an intensity there. There was a, a you know, it's a malignant force there. Yeah. So well, what about this one, though? Is, it, is this a happy Corona? <laughs> That's, that's, I don't know. It looks like a happy Corona, but uh, but uh, you know it, it's it, it was there, so you know, and it was Corona. Yeah, yeah. So so whether I could explain it or not, you know, I, I knew it belonged there. Yeah. You know, we're getting some really great questions. I mean, this this section, and people can see this on the website, is about sort of uh, depicting. The virus and your kind of interest in these, you know, often very modest pieces of um, graffiti or, or street art, um, and you know, again, trying to see, you know, is that is that rabbit wearing a mask? Is you know, uh, for for example, is that elephant we wearing a mask? Is this is this the subconscious of the pandemic kind of coming to the surface? Is, is that an argument you would make? Well, you know, I mean, I started uh, the the basis from where I started is that if I, if, if I was a teenager, if I was a, a young kid here 
and there was this terrific evil force sort of wrecking out things all around us, you know, like maybe taking your grandparents or somebody else's grandparents or, you know, part of your family that you would have, you would react to that. And yeah. of, course, yeah. of course, in the past, you know, I mean, the city is full of people doing graffiti even before that. Now they're doing it much more because they got many more spaces mm -hmm. because businesses have closed so mm -hmm. that so that is going there. And uh, and of course, uh, you know, it's 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 to see a, a, this sort of need to represent this monstrous thing. And of course, you create monsters. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of questions, and I think we should talk about them now. I, I may, I, I can flip back to an image if, if you'd like me to, but um, there's a lot of interest in observing how people um, manipulate and adapt the spaces of the sidewalk or underneath the subway or underneath the, the off-ramp and begin to appropriate them in, in different ways. Uh, and, and thinking about how our cities will change in the future. I mean, for example, uh, there's a question here from Ellen Heller. Um, do you think the outside tables that have now sprung up outside of restaurants um, and the city governments that are giving permission for them to use sidewalks and streets will become permanent after COVID? Um, and and uh, this is, this is um, someone from Baltimore. In short, could a city like Baltimore become like Paris? <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, along, along the same, my my position here, yeah, is basically I want to see what's happening tomorrow. So tomorrow I'm going to be taking the subway and photographing it. Right. It's not right. given to me. I don't, I'm not clairvoyant. I I can't make predictions, but I can see what's going on. Yes. Well, that's interesting, and I think. Ellen's question is a good one because we are, this has been an opportunity in many places to take back street space from the car and give it back to pedestrians. And um, there's a lot of talk in urban planning circles that these will become more permanent uh, interventions in the city and hopefully for, for the better of the city. Um, but this question about the future is still out, still out there, uh, uh, Camilla. Let me ask you another question. Um, Mark Gessner is asking, uh, the photos of the same location over time are fascinating. Does Camillo ever think about what the same location will look like in the future? In other words, how does he think the progression of the past informs what the future may look like? Do, do you indulge in that kind of future uh, thinking, Camillo? Well, you know, I oftentimes have a desire or a projection, but if I go there and I find that the building is not there, has been completely erased. Yeah. You know, then, then what do I do? You know, sometimes, and this is when I started, I said the most interesting thing here are the empty lots because they're pregnant with all this meaning about, you know, what it, what's going to come here? What, how is this going to be used? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that's what, uh, <laughs> my, my role is much more, you know, sort of, how do you say, pedestrian, you know, it's just. Uh, well, the, way, the way you describe it is as a stubborn witness and you, you bring all of this back to us and, and, uh, and, and now we, we interpret it, um, which is why I find these scribblings so, so interesting. Um, and and Mark, Mark's question and, and uh, what, what Ellen is asking about Baltimore becoming like like Paris and you know the, these are very important important questions and you know sometimes I think you do think I, I I'll never forget a conversation we had years ago when you came to Yale to give a talk to my students and um, you know you were taking a lot of photographs of these great American cities that had had come into physical ruination as they were disinvested over over the decades. Um, and you had published a book about Harlem, which you called The Unmaking of the Ghetto, because you were seeing new investment in those places. 
And I asked, you know, um, when you go back to these places, do you want to see new investment um, or, or do you want to see them in ruins? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, if, if, we, if we stay with the pandemic, yeah. one, of, one of my findings, which is, uh, w- w- which, you know, it's that I didn't find that sort of progression of ruins, particularly in areas like Queens and the Bronx, and Brooklyn, but but I found a lot of investment going on and a lot of things that by and large seem to making people's lives more uh, appealing, more pleasant. Yeah. And sometimes my feeling going back to these places is it's, it's just, you know, it, this thing, came when you know when when things were looking better looking looking up right and right. Uh, and uh, and that makes this very sad this whole thing and it makes it understandable you know this sort of thirst that people have and you know you could see it during the summer you know going out and uh, and enjoying you know the spaces that have been created and so on there, there's a question about that from, from an anonymous uh, attendee who asks, do you find that newly created spaces are tied uniquely to capital? And if the removal of capital then renders a space useless, for example, in formal markets, does no sale equal no space? You know, uh, it- <laughs> A lot of it, it's it's it was the city doing there. I mean, there were the little squares. I mean, there's a little square in the hub of the Bronx. Yeah, a little space that is full of people. There's Corona Park on 104th and and Roseville Avenue, and oftentimes those are the places that do have that that particular kind of uh, public investment. You know, the fact that you all of a sudden you look at a school or a fire station and it's 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 a good solid building, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not so much looking at the McDonald's that are in the neighborhood, although there are jobs there, you know, with right. the McDonald's. Let me uh, let me keep moving through some of the photographs here so I can get off this one, although there is a there is a. Um, comment and question here about the bunny from someone else who's an anonymous attendee. When I saw the masked bunny, it evoked memories of gangs holding up banks. Um, (laughs) And this this attendee does not want Baltimore to become like Paris. This attendee says, as for Baltimore becoming like Paris, uh, nah, we want Baltimore to stay the way that it is. (laughs) So that's an editorial comment there. but you know the, these images on on the street. Um, th- there's a lot of them, and and whether it's this kind of informal street art. I mean, there, there's a question about this this too. Um, it does relate to the way that we um, represent the people in the city and uh, represent our history, represent our past. I mean, we've been in the midst of this incredible reckoning, um, and these photographs I think are are, are both from Newark, aren't they, Camilla? Yes. yes. I mean, Newark had first-rate statuary. Yeah. I, I mean, some of the big-time uh, brewers in the city and, and, you know, some of the wealthy uh, business people yeah. or, or, or groups like the Italian colony in one case, uh, they, they, this, the unseen statue of Christopher Columbus uh, was donated by the Italian community in Newark. Mm-hmm. And who do they go? They would go to Rome and find a great uh, uh, sculpture there to do the to do the statue. So it wasn't anything mean, you know, or second rate. But this was a time where um, we're really rethinking who and what gets represented in public space. Um, it's never been. Um, I think a more vital conversation. And there's a juxtaposition between these images and, and these images, which are also photographs of, of memory. Can, can you say something about the, the Make the Road um, 
New York photographs um, that that you found in um, well, in that Queens? Was a very touching set of photographs. Yeah, uh, and very unique because, by and large, you know, it's like New Yorkers have always. Uh, you know, make images of the dead. Let's say when there was the, the gang violence or the drug violence, the city was full of murals of either victims or, you know, drug dealers or, or, or people, you know, just that were shot by mistake or something or other. And uh, so this tremendous thing comes in and kills many more people than the drug dealers killed. Uh, and you look for their pictures on the wall yeah. and you don't find them. But here I did find them. And this was an organization, uh, I think, believe is citywide, that, uh, that asked their members, you know, if they had relatives or friends or people that, you know, that they should put their picture First, they put it online. So if you go to their website, you'll find many more pictures online. Mm -hmm. Then they took this construction site. So behind this wooden fence, there is, a there is a building being constructed. And they put these pictures and they were very, very moving because I'm always interested in sort of a portrait that has power. And these portraits had a lot of power and they weren't taken by Avedon or any of the great photographers. They were just pictures taken in the streets of people living their lives. Yeah. And they communicated that, you know, that sense of living a life in such a powerful way to me that I continue to go there. Yeah. And, as I went there, I realized that the pictures were moving, mm -hmm. you know, that somebody was curating this thing, that mm -hmm. sometimes a picture would fall and people were trampling on the street and then the picture would be put back on. Yeah. Sometimes new people appear in the group of about 30, 32 pictures. Yeah. So there was, it was alive and uh, then all of a sudden, and it wasn't long ago, this was about two weeks ago, this is what happened. Yeah. And you see two little lines, you know, if you look underneath straight from the flag, yeah. and it, said, uh, it said in Spanish and English, do not add pictures without the family's permission. Mm. So, so that's all that there is left there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very happy, you know, I mean, this is something that I did just, you know, this kind of, uh, where this desire to go back and see what happens yeah. uh, led to a story with, with some beginning, middle and end. And, uh, you know, it's most of my stories don't have end. Yeah. But this one, except that the pictures still exist online and they exist at the organization and the Library of Congress. Yeah, it, it is very moving to see the faces of people remembered and documented this way. There, there's a question here um, from Michael Fagan about what picture moved you the most uh, and, and why? In this set? In this well, set of pictures or? In, 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 all, in all of these um, pandemic photographs, I, I think, um, if, is there one that moved you the, the most or not the most, but, but in, in particular that, and I can flip back to it, I actually don't. You have different, you have different ways of being moved. Yeah. I mean, you're very moved by a person that is holding on to a pole on a subway station on 125th Street and it's trying to get on the A train and it's carrying a box of free food that somebody that he got and yeah. he wants to get somewhere. Probably that's his food for the next few days. And he can't move, he yeah. can stand and you see him, you see him going up and down but he can't move forward. And, uh, and you say, what? What is happening to this man? What 
what, you know, and, and you realize, what can I do? How can I help him? And uh, you feel terrible because you don't help him. Mm. You know, and then, and then you, but you can't forget that image. You know, it's just, it's just your last effort. Everything you get keeps you standing. Yeah. Camilla, there's a question coming from, um, from Jason Lempieri. Uh, if you could travel during this time of COVID, which city would you like to document and, and why? I mean, again, again, there is no one answer. I mean, they, they, of course I want to go to Chicago. Of course I want to go to Detroit. And of course I want to go to LA. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Camden, of course, I don't want, I don't forget Camden. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, it's to see how all these places have been touched. I mean, I assume that if I get the vaccine in two, three months, I'll be able to start, you know, seeing the changes, maybe the scars, maybe not the scars. I don't know how you call them, but I will see the changes. That will be absolutely fascinating to um, continue to track this through the, the beginning of the, of the vaccination period. Um, there are a couple more questions here that I think are really excellent. Uh, Karen Darwoon has a question. I wonder what has been Camillo's most remarkable observation of places over time? I.e., has there been a particular neighborhood whose flavor has radically changed? And, and what about gentrification in these places? Well, I'll talk about Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh huh. I mean, Jesus, I have pictures of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, you know. Yeah. It was, it was abandoned, empty factories, you know, few artists that lived there and, you know, and just, uh, it was mostly a Latino neighborhood at that time. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the change was, ex I mean, extreme, the, e extreme. Uh, of course, there are other places like that, but uh, but that certainly is one. I mean, you know, even in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, the south end of the Bronx has changed tremendously. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, where you saw that underpass, the people sitting there and the, you know, the, the restaurant. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, um, in the context of your work over the the decades now, it really um, it's it really generates a lot of a lot of interesting questions because we watch cities like Chicago and Detroit and and Camden, um, you know, sort of physically disintegrate before our eyes in your photographs. And so, when in the in the last series, as you begin to see more investment in these places, it's sort of it's sort of welcome, and yet we know that with so much of this investment comes displacement, that, that now some of these areas unevenly in some neighborhoods in some of these cities, um, they're now dealing with the problems of displacement that come with, with gentrification. How, how do you see COVID playing into some of this in, 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 our, in our neighborhoods? Well, it's certainly not uh, welcoming new investment. I mean, it's certainly a deterrence to new investment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in some ways, you know, the fact that there was so much open space, it just made it difficult. Uh, I mean, take the Bronx, for instance. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there is some gentrification in the Bronx, but mm -hmm. very little. I mean, there was so much empty space to build. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know the, the 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 beginning of those those two story or three story uh, houses that row houses, uh, uh, you know they went to relatively modest people. Those are not places that gentrifiers would move to. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know since then there've been a lot of apartment buildings that have gone up there, and 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 you know they're 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 for middle class or for you know, working class people. Yeah. So, so, so in some sense, the availability of land, of space, uh, you know, was what kept uh, a lot of these places from uh, 
more extreme gentrification. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, I this was the end of my run of slides, although I have some more in the back of this um, presentation. And I'm, I'm wondering, C Camillo, if um, we should look at a few more photographs or if there was one that we've seen that you want to to go back to and, and reflect on. Um, or perhaps a theme that that we haven't quite raised in enough detail that you'd like to talk about. If I can indulge in this, I want to be able to see um, some of the other pictures um, that that I, I mean I can I can begin to show some of them. Um, well, you know, you have you you can show. Let me see that. This, these are creations. These are things that the world had never seen before. You know right. that in East New York, uh, Brooklyn. And uh, and you just stand up and look at it. And you know, it probably won't be there for very long. Uh, but it's good to know that it, it did happen. And it's not uh, people from outer space that came in. Right. You know. Right. This isn't exactly the close encounters of the, th of the third kind. Uh, what, 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 did, what did you see in this image? Well, I saw the two kids, you know, my heart went to them. Yeah. You know, I was just reading a, a couple of lines of poetry from a French poet called Pegu. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, uh, he, he talks about the children and he talks about our work, you know, grown ups and our work. And he says, our work is for them. Yeah. And it kind of stays with me. And I look at those kids, you know, and I say, what? Yeah. What's going to happen to them? I mean, you know, they look perfectly healthy little kids. Mm -hmm. and they have shoes on. And, you know, I'm sure the mother takes good care of them. Uh, but they're there. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that comes through in a lot of your photographs is sort of fashion uh, and the way people represent themselves. I mean, was was that one of the things that 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 made you snap this photograph at that time? Is it is it uh, the kind of fashion statement here? Yeah, and I was I was very relieved to see a, a smile behind that mask. Yeah. Which, which is he's probably saying, I'm happy you took my picture. <laughs> right, right. But, but, I, but yes, yes. And uh, I mean, it's, it's just you, you keep going and you keep looking and it says, rest in peace. So that, that's a memorial. He's a walking memorial from somebody. I think it says rhyme in peace. Oh, rhyme in peace. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, rhyme in peace. But then there is a figure. There is a person there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you don't know if it's uh, if that's a memorial portrait or not. I mean, you you you're documenting the crossroads here, but you're also documenting um, spaces of transport and mobility and transportation. I mean, there's quite a few images in in these exhibits. Um, about the buses, uh, pictures, pictures like this, for example. Well, you, you see, you sort of, we started this, uh, this, this uh, uh, show with a picture of a mural of people cleaning the subway, and it was a beautiful mural. Now that mural was all together on the wall for about six days. Yeah. And then I said, why did people go through all this trouble to put this? And then I seen other, other, other uh, uh, billboards with the same, same theme, you know, about COVID-19. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, you know, you sort, of, you sort of look at this and you say, how much longer are the buses going to have the buses in New York City are going to have images like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, uh, and you say, uh, I mean, I have a granddaughter is a year old. And, you know, someday pro I, I really love to be able to show her and say, look, New York was like this. Yeah. I yeah. was 
there, I'll be 90 years old by then, probably. You know, <laughs> you know, and New York, you should have seen it the way it was in the pandemic. Yeah. And I think, I think this picture, uh, uh, you know, and the fact that some of this, the lines in some of this, you know, sometimes it would have the message in four or five different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this, it, it, it sort of made me very happy to take a picture like this. Yeah. Now we're, we're nearing the, the end of our time here. Um, and there's really just a couple more photographs that I have. Um, but I'm hoping that we can draw you out a, a bit more Camilo in, in some of these last, these last images. Well, yes. I mean, here, this is in, in, uh, in Corona Queens. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a school, you know, obviously had some pride on the school on what they did there, but it was certainly not functioning the way it was functioning in 2019. Mm -hmm. So what you see are all these pictures. Yeah of things that happen. It's like a history. Yeah. It's like, this is what we wear, but this is not what we are. Right. But they don't say that. But the front door though, has pictures of masks, has long list of things to do. If you want to enter the building, they are in English and Spanish. So you see this dichotomy, you see the two, the two sides of this thing, you know, this sort of, this desire to hang on to, to a time when kids could put funny hats on and stay next to each other. Yeah, it, it's, it is very moving this image because what would have been totally commonplace and every day now appears to be so unusual and special just to bring these people together in this way that people could could gather. Um, Camilo, I think we're we're nearing the uh, the end, and we're going to turn it back over to um, to to Brent to kind of wrap us up here. Um, and I just wanted to ask maybe one last question uh, as as we sort of finish for today, because I think that one of the things that um, that I'm always marveling at is sort of your your drive to to document these places. Um, I mean, what what do you want? Or what might future observers do with this imagery? What, how, how do we, how do we begin to, um, to kind of grapple with your monumental work here over time? I mean, I'm glad you feel that way, and I want to thank you for the way you conducted this. Um, um, I, I think, I mean, you're like an orchestra conductor, and you. <laughs> You've been superb. Uh, uh, you know, I just, it's, it's like taking something part of the way. Yeah. Uh, part of the way, it's sort of the years that you've been given to live. And, uh, you know, just sort of trusting and knowing that out there, there are people who may or will find this, you know, sort of interesting and not just interesting, but sort of vital that there is something about the essence of, hopefully, if I can use the word of America, yeah. that is in here. And that if it's not captured and if it's not together and if it's not continued, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying on everything to sort of, give give people a sense of how this is done you know you know this is this is, and and you know just try to give them a feeling that's going to get them somewhere at least they'll get them somewhere it'll get them first yeah in a situation of uh, uh, I would say love of their cities mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it may not get you money, but it, it would certainly get you because your mind, when you go to sleep, will be full of images, you know, of places 
that you want to see and you want to know what are they like now yeah and eventually you know you'll be able to convince other people that this is uh you know that this is what makes lives richer yes and it also makes us part of a much larger world you know it's it's just it it it's not me 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 and uh you know so i i just feel that i'm uh, you know extremely uh, uh, i mean happy and grateful that i've been able to do this because i certainly couldn't do it by myself you know i've had a lot of help certainly the museum the national building museum has been a tremendous help yeah and of course you know since we're working together on this uh, Ellie, you, you have been a lot of help. And then, you know, there's a lot of people have contributed money and effort. I mean, I should make mention my former wife who's edited everything and look at every picture and decided, you know, uh, just talk back and say, no, I don't like this because of this, or you don't say this right. And uh, that has made the work a lot better and uh, the writing, much more clear well that that really is an invitation for our audience to to go to the website and to read the essays um that you've written because they really add a lot and uh we we are incredibly grateful um to you to for, for bringing these images to us and for um recording them for generations to come i think it does um make our lives richer um and so we're, we're very appreciative it's been great to talk to you and to engage our audience uh in this conversation today. Um, and I think I can turn it back over to Brent now. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Elihu and Camillo, uh, for an extraordinary program tonight. And uh, unfortunately, as I said earlier, very timely and will continue to be timely. And I think it reveals how so-called ordinary places and people have such extraordinary stories to, to tell us. And thank you for creating this documentary record, Camillo. Um, our birthday celebration will continue tomorrow at 11 a.m. with a fascinating look at the history, the architecture, and engineering of the Netherlands Carillon, which is located just across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. And I invite all of you to join us at 11 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning. Um, finally, I should mention that uh, this uh, live program was recorded and an edited version will be available within about 10 days on our website, www.nbm.org. Thank you. Stay safe and good night. Thank you. Brent. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.